Good morning. morning. It's good to see so many folks here. If you're a visitor with us at Central, we're honored that you're here, and we hope that you'll find a family with us here. We are well into a series that we've been into over the course of the summer. If you've been here with us, then you know we've been in a series called Supper Time. And the idea behind that is looking in the book of Luke specifically, that about 20% of the book of Luke is meals that Jesus has with, with various folks. And um, all food-related things, even considering when he did, when he fed the 5,000, we looked at that miracle. We've looked at him eating with a few tax collectors. We've looked at him eating with a couple different people. Last week, we looked at um, the institution of the Lord's Supper. It's been read for us this morning in Luke 22. So today, we're actually going to go backwards in the book of Luke. If you've been reading along with us, you probably wondered why we skipped the story of Zacchaeus, uh, a, very, a very popular meal in the book of Luke, in Luke 19, before we got to Luke 22. And I wanted to look at Luke 22 first, the institution of the Lord's Supper, because we don't know the exact time frame of w- between when Jesus was in Jericho with Zacchaeus, which we'll see this morning, and when he finally got in to institute the Lord's Supper, but, but it was a pretty short time most people agree on. So I want you to keep in the back of your mind, we looked last week at this institution of the Lord's Supper. He knew he was about to go to the cross. He knew what that meant. And so I want you to keep that. I did that one first so that you have the context of when you recognize that Jesus is on his way to be crucified. Essentially, this is his last trip through Jericho before he finally goes and institutes the Lord's Supper and goes and is put on trial and all of these things. So when you see this amazing connection that Jesus has with a man that he should not have any connection with whatsoever, I hope it is that much more powerful for you. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 19. It's where we're going to spend, we're going to camp there this morning and spend the majority of our time. I want you to think about these four things because we, we can't possibly look through the story of Zacchaeus without looking at this theme right here. These are the four ways, according to Psychology Today, which is a magazine that did a whole article on self-value and worth, and I was reading through this when I was studying. I read through this a couple months ago as I was preparing for this sermon, and I thought, man, what are the connections here? But they said, this is the four ways that we value ourself. We go on appearance, approval, achievement, and affluence. Now, we kind of know what, what most of these are. We, our appearance is the way we project ourselves to other people. The, the, the better we look, the better that we feel. We, we diet, we eat right, we go to the gym, we do all of these things. We spend tons of money on personal care to improve our appearance. Our approval of our peers, we, we do it constantly to try to fit in with the people that we care about the most. Achievement, we do this all the time at work, trying to uh, you know, get ahead and, and get recognized for these things. And affluence being and having the prominence and the wealth and the things that go all along with these other three. But what do we notice that is the central theme through all four of these? All four of these can fade in a heartbeat. All four of these can go and be taken away in, in, in the beat of a second. So I want us to look here because Zacchaeus was striving after this. We're going to see and we're going to look at Zacchaeus' life and some principles we learn about Jesus through him. But I want you to consider all four of these because in the same article, they talked about this principle right here and this one you may have never thought of. But they said new research has begun to tell us that we tend to base our self-worth, our value on what we think the most important person in our life thinks of us. So you find the person that you care about the very most, and psychologists today will tell you that whatever you think they think of you is how you'll view yourself. So if it's a friend, if it's a spouse, if you perceive that they are viewing you negatively, you'll view yourself negatively. And and conversely, if they are viewing you positively, you'll view yourself positively. So the question is, is is if psychologists are talking about this, well, the Bible has already talked about this thousands of years prior, when it talks about putting Christ at the forefront of our life, and if we will do that, all of these other things will fall in line. So I want to look at, through these two principles, we're going to look at the life of Zacchaeus. 
Luke chapter 19, just starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, I don't do a ton of geography. You, you know this if you've been around Central a ton. But today is going to be kind of a, a unique one. We're going to look at a little bit of the geography and why this was relevant. Now, I want you to look at this map here. And in the top right-hand corner, you're going to see Jericho to the east, a little bit to the northeast of Jerusalem. This is where Jesus was traveling through on his way to Jerusalem. Now Jericho, of course, has significance all throughout the Bible, but in the New Testament in particular, we know from history and archaeology, and it's incredibly fascinating because there's a lot of these remains that are still there, but Jericho was the kind of vacation spot of the rich. In fact, there are ruins that are still here of Herod's, one of his, King Herod, one of his biggest palaces was in Jericho. It was his winter palace. When, when, when it would get cooler, he would go to Jericho because Jericho, it, even still today, is fueled by all of these hot springs. Jericho is sort of an oasis in that regard. Um, if you, we have a few of those here in the States where we have these natural hot springs that are all around um, in these cities and it makes it kind of a tropical climate even um, in the midst of, of desert and things like this. That's what was happening here. So you can go and see these ruins here today, and this is where Jesus was passing through. So it's no coincidence that when we start talking about the guy named Zacchaeus, who we're going to find out is a chief tax collector, a wealthy, wealthy man, it's no wonder that we meet him in Jericho. So I want you to have this context when you recognize that Jesus is hobnobbing around with the very rich, very wealthy, very prominent people of the time. You know, Zacchaeus was not a Herod, but he would have been an incredibly wealthy man. So I want us to kind of consider that as we go into looking at this interaction with Zacchaeus. We've looked at it before. We've talked about Luke 19 in different respects, looking at different parts of this. But I want us to focus on the story as a whole and start here in verse 2. It says, And behold, there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, there's so much here, and I, I fear sometimes we lose the story of Zacchaeus because we have, you know, he was a wee little man and a wee little man. We have the song, which is great, but there's a tremendous amount of, of application for us here today. He was a chief tax collector, he was incredibly wealthy. But he was small, and so he had to go find this sycamore tree. And, and he had to climb out to try to seek where Jesus was. I went down and did some research, and we kind of talked about this in week one when we looked at he just met with a tax collector and what that meant. But somebody did an article. I found two articles from people who were getting their PhDs at Baylor that did some research on ancient um, Israel especially. And these were the top five most despised possession, or, uh, professions at that time. Physicians and butchers, were, I thought that was kind of funny, but, but realistically at that time, they were kind of considered the, the same thing in a lot of regards. Uh, physicians really weren't what they are today. Dung collectors, that was a real job, and as you can imagine, they weren't super popular. Money lenders... We talked about that when we talked about Pharisee, or when we talked about the um, tax collectors. Pigeon trainers was an odd one, but, but it actually makes sense that at that time, pigeon racing was incredibly popular. And for a small bribe, you could pay these pigeon trainers to have their pigeons flop the race. I don't know how they, they do that, but, but there's lots of historical evidence that points to pigeon racing and people kind of throwing these, these races and things like that. But beyond all of that, you have tax collectors. We talked about that in week one, so we won't go into the, the, the true history of all this. But this is who Zacchaeus was. I want you to consider this idea with us this morning. No matter how small I feel, because remember we're thinking about that idea of value and worth and who is the most important person to us, because psychology in the Bible thousands of years prior is going to point us and say whoever's the most important in our life their opinion of us is going to help determine the way we feel about us no matter how small I feel Jesus sees me Zacchaeus was a short 
small man. In fact, we were, I was looking at the actual Greek word there that, that was used for short. And the word there is mikros. It actually gives us our word micro. Um, he, he was a micro man. He was, he was tiny. But he climbed up in this tree. He was seeking after Christ. And we're going to see how important it was that Jesus saw him but called him by his name. It's going to play an important role for us here in a, more, in a moment. Luke 19 and verse 4, continuing right along in our story. He ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. You know, this would have been an incredible sight to see a chief tax collector, someone who was so wealthy, so prominent, climbing a tree. Yet he was so convinced that seeing and interacting with Christ would do something in his life, that he was willing to do it in spite of what it might do to his reputation. Despite how small we feel at times, Christ sees us for who we are, and that's a creation of God. Number two, no matter what others say, Jesus claims me. You know, there are times where, where people say different things about us, and we're going to look at what, it, what a name really means. You probably have never thought about this before, but the name Zacchaeus, literally translated, comes actually from the Hebrew. So it's an Old Testament name, but it means righteous one. Can you think and, and, and just put into your mind this person who is a chief tax collector, someone who colluded with the Romans, we talked about that in week one and week two, was hated, but his name meant righteous one. He was probably called every name in the book. Probably many that weren't recorded in the book because they were so vile and profane. How many times do you think he actually heard his name Zacchaeus? I'm going to guess not very often. I'm going to guess that people called him anything else but his name, knowing what it meant. But Jesus is about to look at him and say specifically, Zacchaeus, come down. Not chief tax collector, not you fill in the blank with, with, with whatever typically people would have said to him. He says, righteous one, come down. Luke 19 and verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, righteous one, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. You know, this verse is one that we kind of sometimes real quickly go over. The whole story of Zacchaeus, we do that too. But in particular, this verse. But I want you to imagine what this was like. This is why I set the stage of what Jericho was like. You know, this is this very, very affluent, rich, wealthy town where people would have been looking. Jesus at this point was well into his ministry. So he was starting to bring really big crowds and this would have been no different. So you've got all of these extremely wealthy, extremely powerful men and women that were watching. And Jesus is, is, is used to people not agreeing with the way he did things. We've looked, that is a central theme of this series where people are, are, are looking at him saying, why are you eating and drinking with sinners? This would have been the grand pumba of them all. Him eating with Zacchaeus would have been an absolute shock. Yet he says it so openly. He says, Zacchaeus, come down quickly. Righteous one, come quick. I have to go to your house. I have to go stay with you. You know, many times, and we've talked about this through this series, but we say, I want to be like Christ. That gets said all the time. And it's a, it's, it's an, it's a life-changing, it's an amazing sentiment. But if we're willing to be like Christ, to the, to the T, what He does, we're going to do. Are we willing to go have these meals? And more, more even, maybe more importantly, are we willing to tell others and not be ashamed that we are going to have these meals? With people that do not look like us, talk like us, sound like us, believe what we believe. Jesus was willing to do that. You and I many times aren't. Certainly we're not willing to make it known to others and, and be willing to say, I I'm going to go do this. Christ was. He said, Zacchaeus, I have to come to your house today. Number three, no matter my struggle, Jesus transforms me. This might be the most powerful point of Zacchaeus' story. He was, he was an incredibly wealthy man. 
And we know even today what wealth can do to folks. How much more difficult it can become to let go of that, to not have that be the very first priority in our life. But look what Zacchaeus says in Luke 19, 8, 9, and verse 10. I included verse 10 also. It says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to his house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. He's saying, Lord, look what I'm willing to do. And I believe he was genuine. I don't think he was trying to get a pat on the back. I think he was, he was telling Christ, This is how convicted I am of what you're saying. We don't have the interaction that Jesus and Zacchaeus have at his home. But context and grammatically it would tell us that this conversation took place after a meal already had happened. The Greeks have different, uh, the, the way that they write with their different prepositions and things can give us some sense of future tense, present tense, past, and, and things like this. This has given us a sense that this is already, the main event has already taken place. But have you ever stopped and wondered why? Because if you miss this, you're missing a huge nugget in this have you ever wondered where four comes from? Why four times? You know, t sometimes when they were asking Jesus, how many times am I supposed to forgive my neighbor? They would say, seven. Is seven times enough? There are times where different numbers have been thrown out in the Bible. Why four? I want you to look here. According to the old law, according to the ancient law, this was the formula for restitution if you were caught doing things. Fraud in Numbers 5 talks about whatever you stole or whatever you defrauded somebody, you would pay back that amount plus 20%. If it was robbery in Exodus 22, we see it was double whatever you took. It was just two times the amount. But then I want you to look what happens in Exodus 22 and verse 1. If, if it's robbery with assault... You pay back four times what you've stolen. Have you ever realized that that is what Zacchaeus was laying at Christ's feet? Remember, he, he, he is going to know all of this scripture well. And so this is symbolic of him saying, I know that what I've done is as wrong as it possibly can be. I know that I have not only stolen from these people, but I have assaulted their life, their beliefs. I've assaulted God because he has is, he is already said that this is not right. This is stealing from others. And so to make this right, he's saying, I'm willing to pay back four times. Because in my heart, in my mind, it's robbery plus assault. And according to the ancient law, that was the restitution. If you ever thought four was just an arbitrary number, there's, there's nothing really in the Bible that's just arbitrarily put there. Zacchaeus was trying to, in the best way that he knew how, demonstrate to Christ the transformation that is happening. These are not hollow words. This is a man that is obviously convicted by what he's hearing and what he's believing. And as we're wrapping up this morning, number four, no matter how far we've gone, Jesus saves you. If we look in this Luke 19 and verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was his purpose. Zacchaeus was a recipient of that, but he came for a much larger purpose than just one. He came to seek and to save every soul on this earth. This morning, if you aren't a Christian, this morning, if, if you have not accepted Christ, if we look back in our text here, when, when Jesus... When Zacchaeus finally did come down out of that tree in Luke 19 and verse 6, it says, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Who is the, the number one person in our life? It should be Christ. And if we look at that and we begin to see the relationship that Christ had with Zacchaeus, the value that he placed on Zacchaeus' soul in spite of what Zacchaeus had done and the life that he had lived, we should have a very clear idea of how he feels towards us. That should make us feel incredibly valuable. That should make us want to go out and show that to other people. That this world is full of individuals that don't know that. 
that are living a life that, that is struggling because they don't know that information. This morning, if that is you, be like Zacchaeus. Welcome Christ joyfully. Be baptized. Have your sins forgiven. That's the opportunity we have. To be, to be a child of the one that is so loving and merciful towards us, but that also was powerful enough to go to the cross and die on our behalf. But this morning, if, if you are a Christian and, you, and you're just struggling in some way and need prayers and support, we'd love to offer that to you also. If you have any need this morning, would you come let us know about it as we stand and as we